this video details the journey of how I made this corset. If you want to know how I made it, then please consider sticking around. And consider subscribing so you don't miss out on my other costuming adventures or my other adventures just in general. Thanks so much for stopping in, so let's get into the video. For the sake of saving time, I went ahead and did a mock-up of the corset beforehand. Made some alterations to the bust area, then cut out my strengthening and fashion layers. This corset is made from two layers of canvas and one layer of teal satin. I base the fashion fabric to the canvas. I'm using Best Press, but any liquid will do to iron out the wrinkles. I should have ironed these before, so don't be like me. After putting the corset pieces together, I took them to the sewing machine, sewing them with a quarter inch seam allowance. Sew the seams of the lining in the same way. I thought it would be a fun pop of color to use as plaid canvas. After sewing all the corset and lining pieces together, I iron open all the seams with my tailored ham, which I fondly refer to as hammy. and repeat on the lining as well. Ironing open the seams is actually very important. I'll show you why in a few minutes, so don't be tempted to skip this step. Pin the corset and lining right sides together at the busk and lacing edges. I'm pinning and sewing from the top to the bottom of the corset. Be sure to always pin and sew 
the corset in the same direction no matter what. I cannot express how important this is. When I get to sewing the boning channels, I'll elaborate more on it. After pinning the waist stay in place, I baste it. Be sure that you are only sewing through the seam allowance and not through any of the corset layers to the front side. Baste the waist stay across all panels of the corset at the waistline. With right sides together, I pin the satin layer to the plaid layer, then sew them together at the busk and eyelet edges. Trim the waist stay ribbon flush with the seam allowance. Then turn the corset half inside out like a sock. Iron the seams to prepare them for the next step. For any of you that may have skipped the step of ironing open the seams, this is where the step comes into play. Sandwich all the seams, pinning them into place. Repeat for every seam. And of course, I had to give Kitty some kisses to encourage her to help elsewhere. 
With a marker, I trace the edge of the busk like a template, skipping over the loop. I will be sure to sew only on my marker lines and not past, or else the loops won't fit into the slots. I pinned the facing to the plaid lining and sewed along my markings, back stitching at the beginning and the end of every line of stitching, and skipping over the spaces where the loops will be. I decided to stop procrastinating and sew the loop side of the busk. So here we go. It would have been easier to sew the busk before all the pieces were assembled, but inserting the busk isn't my favorite thing to do. With matching thread, I rolled the end of the ribbon over and sewed it down, then tacked it to the lining of the corset, making sure not to let any of the stitches pierce to the front of the corset. Ideally, I would have sewn the waist stay into the same seam as the busk, but it turned out that right where my waist stay needed to be matched up perfectly with one of the loops, so I had to come up with a different plan. Then I flipped the corset right side out, ironing the busk and lacing edges of the corset. Okay, this will probably be the most painful part of the video, simply because I should have inserted the loop side of the busk sooner. There really isn't anything wrong with inserting it this late in the assembly process, other than it's a bit more difficult to do so. So don't be like me. Insert the loops into the gaps of the stitching and pin into place.
Begrudgingly, I start on the knob side of the busk, lining up the top and bottom of the corset, overlapping the loop, then mark the fabric with a white colored pencil. Future. In the very near future, I plan to invest in an awl so that I don't have to continue to use this antique ice pick and a paintbrush to widen the hole. With the ice pick, I mean the awl, I pierce upwards on my mark from the underside of the fabric. The whole point of using an awl is to open the weave of the fabric and not actually break the fibers. This will ensure the fabric around the knobs or grommets won't tear out. It's a good idea to use a small drop of fray check as well to prevent fraying, especially on delicate fabrics. So here's where I really struggled. Basically, I used the ice pick and the paintbrush handle to get the hole wide enough to get the knob through, then repeat the process for all the knobs. The first one seemed the hardest for some reason, but the rest seemed to go faster. I forgot to film me actually doing this, but I basted both sides of the busk. These stitches don't have to be neat because I'll remove them later. Because the satin is so delicate, and when I used the awl to open the weave of the fabric, the satin fibers tore a bit, so I'm using fray check to ensure the fabric doesn't continue to fray. Then I use my zipper foot to sew right next to the busk. Using a ruler, I mark two inch diagonal lines on the cross grain of my fabric.
I used a bias tape maker to help fold the fabric into bias tape, then rolled it up and let it cool down. With a ruler and chalk, I marked the boning channels according to this diagram, which is similar to the diagram in the instructions. The Edwardian era was known for the use of double boning channels. Each line on the diagram indicates a double boning channel. I also placed double boning channels down the center back of each back panel. Initially, I thread marked the chalk lines so I wouldn't lose them. And as you can probably guess, this method wasn't the smartest decision. After the channels were sewn, it was a nightmare to remove the threads. I ended up ripping out all the thread markings, replacing them with pins, then proceeded to sew the rest of the bunny channel. I trimmed up the raw edges of the corset in preparation for attaching the binding. Pinning along the chalk marks, I top stitched with the machine. If you notice, I've already bound the bottom edge on this half of the corset, even before sewing the boning channels, and I shouldn't have done so. There's no real harm in doing this, other than I have to stop my machine as close as possible to the binding without actually sewing over it. I left my threads long and knotted them on the underside of the corset later.
Working with my zipper foot attachment, I sew out a boning channel down the back edge of the lacing panels. The eyelets will be set either to the left or to the right of this bone. After inserting the bones into the channels, I mark with a sharpie the length of the bones at the edge of the corset. Then I pull the bones out, two at a time, cutting them a half inch below the sharpie line. Then I trimmed the edge of the corset and attached the binding. Mysteriously, the footage of me sewing it on has disappeared. With matching thread, I attached the beading lace trim. With matching thread, I attached the beading lace trim. This lace is something I had in my stash. I think it's pretty, but I will most likely replace it with something more appropriate. I threaded the decorative ribbon through the eye of a large needle, threading it through the design of the lace. Unfortunately, my ribbon is polyester, but you know, it's what I had in my stash. I'll change it out if I find a better silk ribbon.
Then I fiddled around for quite a while untwisting the ribbon. To finish off the end of the beading lace, I had to slice into it so that the top loop of the busk would insert through the lace. I trimmed the ribbon, folded it over a few times to hide the raw edge, and slip stitched it into place. I'm not sure if I've ever adequately expressed how much I really, really don't care for making corsets. And I realize that statement doesn't make sense, considering all the corset videos I've recently put on my channel. But there is a step I do enjoy other than when I finish a corset, and that's flossing. Some of my earliest sewing projects were embroidered pillowcases or sachets filled with lavender. Embroidery is also a good way to sharpen hand sewing skills, so naturally I fell down that inevitable rabbit hole of research when trying to find a flossing design for this corset. I found multiple extant examples of flossing designs and tons of variations on a V-shaped design. I came across Kathy Hayes' live journal post about the Symington corset sampler. There are absolutely tons of intricate designs to whet an embroiderer's appetite, such as mine. The design I chose isn't difficult once you get the hang of it. Start the embroidery design by knotting two strands of embroidery thread on the underside of the corset. Stitch one and two. Stitch three starts on the right side of one, ending at the fourth stitch. Stitch five starts on the left side of one, weaves under three, ending at stitch six. Stitch 7 starts on the left side of 5, weaves over 1 under 3, ending at stitch 8. Stitch 9 starts on the right side of 3, weaves over 5 under 7, ending at stitch 10. Stitch 11 starts on the right side of 9, under 5, over 7, ending at stitch 12. Stitch 13 starts on the left side of 7, over 1, under 3, over 9, under 11, ending at stitch 14. Stitch 15 starts on the left side of 13, under 1, over 3, under 9, over 11, ending at stitch 16. Knot the thread on the underside of the corset to finish the embroidery design. In case my verbal instructions were confusing, I put together a slideshow to help illustrate the steps. This embroidery design can be done without weaving the threads. Here are a few still shots of the finished corset. Please stay tuned for my next video where I try on the corset and review it in better detail.
thanks so much for stopping in. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing so you don't miss out on my other costuming adventures and adventures we will have.